one of the things that I'm so struck about this film is actually in a way how, how quiet it is and how, and how deeply visual it is. Right? There's, every time I see it, there's, and there's, there's so many choices that you've made. There are voiceovers, but no talking heads. You don't see the experts. You're not actually riding on their positions to give legitimacy to, to, their, to the, what they're saying. Right? So this could be four friends sitting around a drawing room instead of an expert house or a planner or an academic. And that, for a lot of documentaries, that voice is so consciously summoned, right? that I'm talking to you about SRA and the flaws in the scheme, and I must give weight to that voice. But you've left it in a way that it's equivalent in the way we see it as filmmakers. We hear it equivalently to the stories you hear about the guy who's become a contractor and a carpenter and bought three flats and the guy who got moved. And there's so there's and that disconnect sort of links to, you know, in, in one, one of the things in your biography that I find interesting is it describes you as much as a visual artist as, as a fiction and non-fiction filmmaker. And you know, I think of all these images that stay in my head of the empty corridors of the SRA building, of the, um, the you know, it's only later in the film that you realize that the shiny buildings next door are a new housing development. Until then, they just sort of sit, you don't quite know what to make of them. And for a moment, you actually feel like the rest of the SRA scheme will, will grow up to become this, and there's that other disillusionment. Tell me a little bit more about those choices, about, about the way you handle the narrative, about the decision not to have the interviews, about letting this film rest in a way, a series of visuals that we could connect up in multiple different ways. It's almost like letting go of a certain narrative, you know, allowing us to undo and redo your film. Thanks, Gautam. I can lecture for about an hour on that. <laughs> Okay, five minutes, okay, fine. So, um, well, to start with, I mean, this is also an extension of, you know, this thing got discussed yesterday in the entire uh, discussion on uh, non-fiction filmmaking. And I would say that, you know, my primary way of relating to the medium is through the camera because I'm trained essentially as a cinematographer. I work as a cinematographer for others. And uh, my response to the whole thing was more through the experience of the architecture visually and um, how best one could use that you know in the given duration of the film and again a question that came up yesterday was how do you decide the duration of the film and in this case the answer is I had a producer who said you have to make a 28 minute film so there's a telecast version which is shorter and there's this version which is the version that I prefer and which has been accepted by the producer so um, so within that um, also I mean like we were discussing earlier it was much more important for me to make this film completely experiential and you know let people look let people see things instead of a talking head informing them of what it was about and uh, so whether it was it was and and in the immediate disparity that comes in the immediate power structure that 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 you establish like you said by by having a an academic, uh, uh, an urban studies professional, and um, uh, you know, a, a resident of, the, of, of, of this entire scheme. I just completely decided to go away, do away with that, and at a completely practical, functional filmmaking level, it allows me to pace the film with much greater control. You know, slow it down, slow it down, space things out, make make it more experiential. Because if I'm talking a certain way, or if you're talking a certain way, the camera has to respect that you know you you get stuck with the the, the 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 entire temporal feeling of that so it offered me greater control and a thing also was that um, this building where the film is set is among one it, it, it's among the earliest um, settlements of this kind which was uh, after the whole sra program came into being which is this entire model of of redevelopment where private builders are given major incentives because the state doesn't have the money to or rather the state doesn't want to spend or the state doesn't state doesn't want to spend this kind of money creating so much housing you know uh, because you want to vacate some areas because they have become way too profitable to allow slum developers to sit on having semi legitimized them over the years um, and you you don't just want to throw people out so you want to give them what looks like free accommodation so you build in, uh, you, you uh, involve private builders and say, okay, we are giving you land. We are giving you land. You make these uh, buildings. And because you are making these buildings which are to be given out free to slum dwellers, we are giving you twice the amount of land which you can then sell at commercial rates. And 
you don't have to think too hard to imagine what kind of money is getting made in the process and what kind of money is changing hands among corporates, among builders, among uh, ministers, among politicians, among absolutely everybody. So what the stakes are in that case. And um, so this was among the earliest settlements of this uh, scheme, which was completed in the late uh, 1990s. And this uh, group of people, strictly speaking, they're not, uh, I mean, if you get into the whole uh, technical terms, it's not really an SRA, it is what is called a PAP project, project affected parties, where the ex airport had to be expanded, so people were moved out, and uh, a flyover had to be constructed, so people were moved out to this location, so they're project affected parties. And um, what amazed me is the complete grandiose architecture of the space, which has been designed by a star architect, who is also one of the architects uh, involved in the design of the Bombay airport. So you make the airport and you design the SRA to rehabilitate the people. So therefore these great architectural, uh, these, these geometric spaces where you have a triple heighted atrium with this triangle and you have these circular windows and these rectangular windows, it's very graphic. It's really very graphic, can be very attractive. This is actually among the better projects. There are other projects which happened later in areas like Vashi and Mankhot which are really very bad where the separation between two buildings could be half the width of this hall, you know, a 10 story building. So you see what happens to light and ventilation and so on. Um, I did not get access to those. This is what I had access to and I decided to make b the best of what it offered in terms of the buildings are not that bad. It's another matter that these buildings are again placed very close to each other. So if there's ever a fire, there's no way a fire engine can, can get inside, you know, no way. Um, these were among, you know, some of the choices that I made and, and these, these, were, these were among the reasons for the choices that the, which dictated the form of the film. But it's interesting because in some sense, you know, th there is a letting go, but how then do you see your role, how heavy or light do you feel like your hand is in curating this, right? Because there, it is an interesting set of choices you've made in terms of the narratives there are. There is the narrative of the entrepreneurial resident who owns three flats. And, it, I mean, and the visuals there are very strikingly the sense of the flowing highway. And the, there is the, the history narrative one that's lost. There is, there's, there's complexity in a lot of these. So in a sense, how much, do you, how much do you feel like you have a point to make? And how much are you able to really? I was imagining what this film would look like without any sound. And actually just, and, and, so, and, and, there's, and then, you know, as I was imagining that, serendipitously, the sound went off for three seats and the planes kept landing and it was completely silent. And then there was a figure where there's an old man sitting watching out of a toilet. It, you know, and I'm thinking again of pushing that, of pushing the envelope even more. Do you think you could have actually let this film be without any of the narrative? I was uh, under pressure to do that. I was really under pressure to do that, to make it abstract, in the, within quotes, abstract kind of way, you know. So, because you're dealing with architecture, so uh, there were a lot of uh, my friends who, and colleagues who expected a more abstract and again within quotes a more RT film, you know. But then I was very clear, I was very, very clear that, you know, I was making this for a certain purpose, I wanted it to be a little more accessible that way, experiential and yet giving a certain amount of information and I really feel that um, the film medium uh, is not the right, kind, uh, right medium to give all the information that you have to give on a particular subject, you know. I feel it's, it's, it's much more important to, to create a kind of curiosity and inquisitiveness to, to, to get people interested and, and sensitized so that they can get it themselves. And on a subject like this, you really don't have to look very far. It's in the papers every day. It's absolutely in the papers every day, which is the reason why I too was interested. It's all the, the other part of it also is that I've been working very, very closely with an architecture college with architects and urban studies professionals. You know, it's a college um, where I've been teaching for a number of years. So I've been in the middle of this entire debate on uh, urban redevelopment. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to have those voices. I want to have those, uh, the, the, the interviews used as, as commentary in the background. Because I, yeah, somehow I, I, I just felt that I wasn't very convinced with the idea of making a completely abstract film, though I mean, yeah, it would be fun to do, really. But what do you feel about that? I mean, I, I, I think I have such a close relationship to the empirics of this, this issue sure. that I actually literally use it experientially. Because I think one of the things about 
in, and, I, and I say that, and, and I'm going to, I mean, let me tell you about how, the kind of reactions I get when I teach with it. And then I'm going to ask you about how, what the experience of screening it is in Kamala Rehita, right, which is where you teach at the School of Architecture in Bombay, especially given how spatial the film is, especially given this architect, and especially, and now I'm going to possibly get myself short, um, architecture predilection towards architects and spatial solutions. Um, even at their reflexive best. And I think one of the things that one of the things that a lot of my students when they see this film like about it is that they feel like it allows them to make up their own mind. Um, what unsettles me when I'm teaching with it is that they will make up their own mind. You know, and I think that one of the things about but in the end there is that moment of productive tension where they will they will point to different parts of it. They'll look at different parts of it. And you know that and one of the things, you know, just as an example you can give a lot of empirics about 40%, 50%, 60% of Bombay slum. Or you can have that last shot, right? that last shot of landing in Bombay and watching the cityscape. And if you look at it as an architect or a planner, there is a way in which the complete split in reactions to people, how they read that landing shot. And you know, it sort of answers that scale question in a second. So I think what's really interesting for me about precisely that sense of experience, I think this is something that the film does wonderfully. And I think it allows students to get to it because you can't see the emptiness of that building, that SRA building, and walk away convinced of it as a narrative of progress and the next move forward and, and the fact that it's worked. Right? So it, even spatially, it sort of tells the story of its own undoing in that sense. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship, what's the sense you get when, when you teach in Kamala Rehaja with the architects? How do they respond to the film? I'm really glad. I'm, I'm really very glad that, you know, for a film which does not follow the usual um, activist documentary language. It's, it's, it's a film that's being used a lot by the activists. I have been interested um, in the non-fiction, in, 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 in the non-fiction form as a, as, as a, in the various kinds of non-fiction filmmaking, you know, um, because I guess at some level I am interested in form, you know, and, and, and the form of the of of, of uh, all the forms that a non-fiction film can take, and uh, and for the last several years I've really been interested in the history of the documentary medium, the languages of the documentary, and one of the things that comes out of it is my uh, I have a great interest in the history of the propaganda newsreel of especially made by the Films Division, which is quote quoted from extensively here. You know, and um, the only on-screen villain that you have is somebody from 1971. You know, so very often, you know, your documentaries can be divided into people who are victims and people who are villains, and so on. And uh, definitely didn't want to do that. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, coming back to the form of the documentary film, I mean, I think the possibilities are completely endless. Are really completely endless, and uh, it becomes again like yesterday. You know. We were talking about what is actually legitimized by, let's say, mainstream Bollywood is a certain kind of filmmaking. Likewise, for the longest time, you know, there's um, there's a lot of filmmaking that was looked down upon. You know, I think it's 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 better now. You know, I, I really think it's better now, and there were very very strong reasons for that. So, um, if Films Division was making these outright propagandist films for the longest time in our history. Um, the activist films later were the most important voice against them. And for then after that, you know, with the collapse of Films Division, that became the established norm. You know, and anything outside of it had really had to struggle. So I mean, I think this is a time when a lot, th there is the scope for, for a lot of experimentation with form within non-fiction. And non-fiction is one area that allows you to do it because you are not tied, tied to distribution. So, um, I like the documentary. Let me take some questions. Uh, one here, and then at the back. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Parvati Rao. Um, I'm actually uh, an architect and I've done my undergraduate studies in Kamala Reja. So, <laughs> so, I'm glad to see that my college has supported uh, the production of this uh, film. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, actually first to, to tell you during my fourth year urban design uh, and planning studio, which was uh, headed by Rohan uh, Shivkumar, <coughs> we were told to actually do a slum redevelopment project. So we had to obviously first study a slum and then respond to that. 
Um, so I had looked at the, the slums that had developed along uh, Varsova Beach, and um, they had been evicted once, and they had been housed. And a lot of the people said that what they began to do was they either sold whatever they had been allotted, or they had rented it out and it became small commercial establishments within that building and then developed for anything else. So what they said was that there was actually, the money that they were getting from that, they began pouring into where they, where they were living and they actually wanted to construct more formal settlements along that. And they said that they just you know, started, uh, they liked the communal living, they liked the fact that everybody sort of shared something and they used to help each other quite a bit. So he, I mean a lot of them said that they just, they said this whole thing about housing people again is just a complete charm and it's a failure in many ways. So I just wanted to ask you, I mean this was one such instance, have you encountered this in the studies that, or in the research that you've done actually towards the production? It's there in the film, the story of Munir the Carpenter, which complicates the story, which, yeah. which prevents the film from becoming a Dukbari Kahani you know, of people. So it is, and, 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 and it is said even at the end of the film by um, one of the experts, that people just come and hand out people money, you know, saying here's X amount of lakhs of rupees, leave now. Give us your papers and leave now. So, I mean, nobody is saying that, um, that there is one set of evil people and one set of good people who are therefore victims, you know. I mean, people are, there are people who have definitely made a lot of money, like the case of Munir the carpenter here, who's become a contractor and who's bought three houses and has gone back to live in Bharatnagar in, 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 in um, BKC, uh, Bandar Kutla complex, you know. So, there is all of that. There really is all of that and, and stories of, of um, the entire property mafia working within the, within the community in collusion with builders and with, with, with politicians and so on. To make, you know, to make situations where power is a problem, electricity is a problem, infrastructure is a problem, so people sell out very cheaply and go. So there were all these stories where, and it, it, it's again said in the film, people sold out the, their rooms illegally. They're not supposed, if you're given something free, you're not supposed to sell it for a period of 10 years. There's a lock-in period of 10 years. Sell it out for 50,000 because you just can't afford to live there. You know, you just can't afford to live there. So it's a complicated story and I don't, I, at least I don't have the figures of how many people have actually gained out of it and how many haven't. But uh, it's, it's really very complicated and, it, you know, everybody is, is part of it. Absolutely everybody is part of it, which is why you realize you are actually talking about powers that are huge, that are massive and behind it is huge global money. You know? So if people ask me what is the purpose of this film, uh, my, the purpose of this film or any film in that case is, uh, is to be able to talk about the subject, to be able to, 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 to let people experience and, and educate people on you know, something in a short amount of time, half an hour, you know, and uh, decide for themselves really decide with them, is, is this good or bad or not, you know, so. Yeah, uh, a personal response. What struck me about the film was uh, uh, what Gautam was talking about, you know, the uh, silence, uh, but a silence of stasis of uh, people who seem to have been marooned, you know, brought in marooned here, here. and uh, the silence spoke actually quite loudly, more uh, loudly than the commentary itself. You know, then the comments of uh, the people and so on. And uh, I was thinking uh, this is a very eloquent comment, you know, the silence, the silence of stasis, not the silence, any other kind of silence, the silence of, of a people who have just been dumped there like rubbish. You know. And uh, that quality seems to speak uh, and seem to say something about uh, the visual aspect of it also. You have talked about the architecture, but it is an architecture that comes from a certain kind of a planning. And it's a planning that, you know, it's a top-down planning, doesn't take any account of the needs of the people. And so obviously if you compare it with, you know, uh, well-settled slums, you know, like uh, other places, you know, uh, uh, you have a certain kind of a community living, a certain kind of community uh, spaces, all of which is completely missing here. Here is each one to themselves. You know. So for me, the, uh, uh, the aspect of, uh, you know, the, the sound aspect was much stronger than the visual aspect and spoke much more loudly. That is one comment I have to make. And the other comment I have to make is uh, for us in Bangalore, who have witnessed one of the most brutal evictions, I come from a human rights organization called PUCL. We are bringing out a report on this. 
and uh, for us and it's a very it's an awful kind of a comment on the kind of project that is coming up it's a ppp project and it tells us a whole lot about uh, you know about uh, the concept of ppp where it where it's going to lead these people to so i have a sense of a doomed community that is a direct by product and that's a direct result of uh, the state policy of urban housing for the poor um i was interested in the relationship between the way I was interested in the relationship in the way that you exerted the black and white documentary that was um portraying slum dwellers in a very particular uh way and in the way that you chose to film the inhabitants. I'd like to hear a little bit about the the relationship between those two portrayals as you see it as um in the black and white footage as i mentioned is found footage you know from earlier films made by the state on the issues of development and slums and so on whereas um i mean our entire experience of of working in the space and uh, we had very limited access to the space this, this film was made in a short very short period of time and unlike many other films where you know you engage and you spend a lot of time with people and uh, build relationships and so on um so we absolutely made no attempt to cover up the fact that we are outsiders here you know we are outsiders and um, the problem that happens while making a film which you know is about a a very strong subject like this which i mean of course people feel very very strongly about um was complicated by the fact that um this film was to be shown on doordarshan you know and uh, uh people's expectation was that you know because it, it would be telecast on the national broadcaster they would the state would probably hear them and i'm repeating what i said yesterday so i'm um, those who were here please bear with it um what also is a problem um, you know from from uh, filmmaking terms is that people have completely gotten used to a news television soundbite culture which is loud which is uh, you know which has its entire dynam dynamics of power so uh, it's not it you know it it was not the tone that we wanted for this film you know that entire performative as aspect of of giving an interview of saying something pertinent of wanting to be heard which can be a very very powerful i'm i'm definitely not saying that you know a, a testimony is is not a uh um powerful tool to use in a film but uh, it's not something that was working for us in this case so every time we'd want to shoot people in their spaces every time we'd want to shoot people in their spaces the usual documentary thing to do is to tell people okay please go about your business pretend we're not here you know we'll shoot this as within quotes naturally as possible to construct sequences out of it whereas here people presented themselves to be photographed you know i think um, the fact that we were shooting with a dslr camera which looks like a still camera had might have had something to do with it because they thought it's a still it's a still picture so they sat you know they sat and there's a shot of that woman who is who, the pallu of her sari falls in the course of the take you know that was what they offered and that was what we decided to go with you know instead of saying no 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 please wash your dishes please do this please watch television please let your son do his homework and and so on you know so we can show life within the community this is what they offered at a very formal level and we maintained that formality which for me went with the formality of of the architecture itself and the way of shooting it so it's something that you know it was a language that got evolved on location really on location so i don't know if that answers your question but yet yeah, to some extent you said uh, you had no access to some worse places than this if i understood you correctly uh, what what was the reason uh, did you need permission uh, for example for this film did you need anyone's permission it, like i mentioned earlier you there is such a high level of anxiety in a space like this 
because uh, it could be taken away at any point. So you arrive from the outside and there are these, you know, there are these eyes looking at you and you can sense it. You go with a camera, it's even worse, you know, camera and a microphone and so on. Um, and people think that you've probably, co probably come to conduct a survey to get an idea of what could be done, what this is worth and so on. Um, uh, and it's coming from the history of, of many, many uh -huh. NGOs being involved in the whole process and the project, you know, being executed in a problematic manner. So if you come from the outside, if you come from the outside and um, uh, so there would be, one would hear these voices from somewhere, hey, the Reliance guys are here, here they can, they're conducting a survey and stuff. It was very hard. It was really very, very hard to go about our business. So one had to enter through an NGO that was working in this space. I did not get that kind of access in the other space. So it, it's an NGO that conduct, that has a health clinic and a primary school for girls in the building. There, there are 36 buildings, we had access to one of those. So that was the kind of um, access we had, you know. So, mm -hmm. and the building that we had access to is among the better buildings. So. I mean, I, I can, you can relate to this very much in terms even of doing any kind of research in, not just, I would say, I mean, I think when you look at when, when some kind of power structures are involved in communities of vulnerability are involved, um, spatial vulnerability like homelessness or bus, these are one, only one example of them. But in situations of conflict, for example, it could be religion or ethnicity or identity. The, the act of looking, counting, cataloging, surveying, filming, um, you know, very much are linked with the expression of powers to where people are in the first place. I mean, for, for say in many of the communities that I've worked with, the surveys associated not with the moment, it used to, the older narrative used to be that the survey was associated with the moment of the possible formalization, the possible entry into legality, the possible entry. Um, but over the last 20 years, particularly in the cases of informal settlements and bastis, with increasing cycles of eviction across all our cities, what you're actually seeing, the survey is associated with an impending eviction. It is seen as an act of very, very strong power. And I think that's one of the questions that I think that, that particular, I mean, the survey is a particular form, but I imagine the camera comes very much in the same place. And, and it's partly coming between how, how these spaces that were once you know, what's interesting about the, the found footage and the black and white footage is it's patronizing and it's offensive and it, and it, but at the same time, there is, it, it, there are terms of engagement. You know, it, it, and there are, there are, there are, it would it, be very interesting to compare the ways in which current state policies uh, don't use language that is explicit, but in a way are actually much more distancing of the poor, are actually much more dismissive, are actually do not even bother to talk about the possibility of the eventual integration of the development story. So it's pulling apart those languages, I think, is also very important. But this question of access and this question of power also turns the lens back on us, you know, those who are researchers and filmmakers who go into these communities, unless we have spent time within them, have other histories within them, have other identities within them. And I think that becomes very important. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, just to give you another example, that when I made my initial visits to this place, um, I parked my car somewhere, I walked for about a kilometer, and when I started talking to people, they said, you've parked your white Sentra over there. You know? So, y you're being looked at, you know, you're being looked at. Anybody who's coming inside from the outside is being observed and looked at. And it, it doesn't take much imagination to, you know, know that there is a lot of unemployment, there are a lot of people who are just hanging around and so on, because people have lost employment, you know. Uh, another, again, you know, statistic about Bombay is that if 65% live in slums, there are as many people who walk or cycle to work, uh, which means that they are wor they're, they're working very close to where they live, you know. So if you're moving people 20 kilometers away from where they live, how are they going to travel, you know, and uh, in, in a space like this where there's no approach road when you arrive. So it really doesn't, you know, take much imagination to think what actually is going on, you know just how hard it is for everybody. Of course, people want a pakka house, people want a toilet within their house and, you know, and a bathroom and a kitchen and so on. You know, all of that is there. And I do think that in the community living of a slum is, is, is uh, something that's uh, special in a way, but also over-romanticized. You know, it, it is over-romanticized because it's not like everybody's having a great time there. Yeah? Everybody wants a pakka roof which doesn't leak, hopefully. So. But I think one of the things that also gets, gets changed is that just as the building is a particular political economic form and a choice, the slum also doesn't exist for no reason. Its form is a result of a particular set of trade-offs and choices, where you decide to put your money, where, what you decide to build. So 
families. So I think one of the things that we forget also, and this goes back to the, your earlier comment about thinking about one of the biggest issues in upgradation is that you pretend that you're beginning from nothing. Okay. So you actually erase the history and the particularity of the form that these communities have been built this way because of a reason. Right. The, and, and part of that communal life is a very strong economic reason of capital, access to loans, savings, and daycare, right. which are very key economic decisions that middle class families make in very different kinds of ways. Right. We shift residents in very different kinds of ways. We move in very different kinds of ways. So often when you see resources that come into slum communities but don't see immediate improvements in the built environment because other decisions are being made, that money is being put to other kinds of uses. It may be to send one kid to an English-speaking private school as opposed to put a, put, tain your tarp wall into brick. But we see those choices as illegitimate. Right? We don't, we're not seeing those as, as, as markets in themselves. So where often people are said, you know, people talk about our dysfunctional housing market. Our housing markets work very well. Because poor people keep and choose housing that matches their economic livelihood gain. And what you see in an SRA project is a movement to a built environment that has no relationship to the livelihood or earning capacity of the people living in it. And is not a choice that they would have made themselves. So actually the SRA is the dysfunctional housing market. Except that when we come at it from those senses, we don't recognize these communities as markets that function and allocate resources very efficiently. Sure. How much I've been influenced by Films Division and uh, Sukhdev and other filmmakers immensely, really immensely, because you know, again, you know, talking about the accepted modes of uh, documentary film and 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 the non-fiction film language, there is such a great wealth of, of of films in different forms that exist from within FD and 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 outside, you know, which are there for us to to look at and 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 take from. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how else to answer your question uh, in terms of my influences. It, it, it is from, um, I mean, an experience of the city itself, you know, the, with the entire visual experience of the space, from uh, my experience as a documentary filmmaker and having watched all the films that I have, you know. So, um, yeah, it's, it's all of those things. So, and, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 I mean, I was just saying that, um, very often we talk about uh, Bombay, Hamara Shahar and Vertical City together because they are on the, the same subject and I mean Hamara Shahar is something which was made in 84 or something and it Shastri's uh, The Burning Sun but the first film of its kind which was made by an independent filmmaker you know so it's, it, it, it's an enormously important film you know that entire movement you know which was the only voice which was not the state's voice, which was an independent voice, which was, you know, which was a giving a voice to the other side, you know, so it, 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 it's a very significant, very, very, it's an invaluable part, part of, our, uh, of, of, of our history, of, of our visual history, of documentary history. So one references all of that, one really references all of that, or if, if not directly, then one is aware of all of that while making a film. You know, so. There's this uh, SRA building in Mankhod, Lallu Bhai compound, so we, we, we did do the work there. That's the one I didn't get access to. So, so we didn't... Uh, we tried finding some local contacts and we went and we spoke to people but of course people thought we were being very invasive when we went and shot there. The film did manage to make it but point is that there were a lot of buildings which were empty there. Huh? Like there were people who were being lifted from Dadar, P. D. Mello Road and everything. But there were a lot of empty buildings also. So what I wanted to ask was because I'm not in touch with uh, all of that. Have there been any policy changes or is it something which continues to be the way it is? That they evict slums and they sort of... No. Let me thank all of you um, for being here through the film, but I'm going to take this moment actually to let us first thank Mukul um, for closing the film out for us. Thank you very much.